Welcome to my monthly podcast series titled Becoming a Sage. My name is Jan Freed, but you can call me Dr. Jan. In this series, I interview people to seek wisdom about living and leading a life on purpose. My passion is helping people find purpose and meaning in their lives on a daily basis for the rest of their lives, a concept I call breadcrumb legacy. I'm also on a mission to retire the word retirement. We are not retiring from life, but we're moving on to something else. And I believe it takes time and intentional thought to successfully move on to what's next in life. Today, I'm interviewing Ellen Goodman. She's a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. She was one of the first women to open up the op-ed pages to women's voices and became, according to Media Watch, the most widely syndicated progressive columnist in the country. In 1980, she won the Pulitzer Prize for Distinguished Commentary. She's written seven books and received all kinds of awards and recognition. And in uh, 2010, Ellen co-founded the Conversation Project, a public engagement campaign and movement that works to change the way people talk about and prepare for their end-of-life care. It is because of the Conversation Project that I wanted to reach out to Ellen and learn more. For more information about Ellen, please refer to the bio posted at the end of this podcast. Well, welcome to the series, Ellen. Thank you. It's nice to be here or wherever we are. In That's true. Cyberspace. I've, been a, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I've read your articles. I have a, uh, a book. Um, I have a book of yours. In fact, one of the chapters I've cited, um, it's where you talk about Groundhog Day and, you know, meaning and purpose and, you know, is every day the same? And so I cite you a lot. So I'm actually starstruck right now. <laughs> so I'm honored to have the chance to interview you. So, well, Day is particularly relevant since I am sheltering in place like every other American. This is <laughs> and right. many of these days do feel like Groundhog They do kind of feel like Groundhog Day. That's true. That's true. Well, I want to talk about the Conversation Project, and one of my favorite quotes that I often use is from the book Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Albom, based on the true story, Mitch is dying of ALS, he's a favorite former professor of Mitch, and he tells Mitch, when you know how to die, you know how to live. Hmm. And um, I know you started the Conversation Project because most people do not want to talk about death, most people don't even want to think about it. So tell us about the project and what you've learned since starting it in 2010. Well, I, I actually started thinking about this in the wake of my mother's death. So it was a personal story. And as a journalist, that's been one of the most fascinating things uh, to discover, that everybody has a story. I mean, everybody has a story about a good death or a hard death. And for me, um, my mother and I had talked about everything. I used to laugh that, you know, she was the kind of person you could tell your problems until you were bored with them, you know. <laughs> and um, except for one thing, which is how she wanted to live at the end of her life. And toward the end of her life, she had dementia. And at that point, she couldn't say what she wanted for lunch, let alone what she wanted for end-of-life treatment, the care she wanted, the care she didn't want. And as she declined, um, all of those decisions fell to me, and I often wished that I had had this conversation with that I had known what she would want me, what she would want me to decide when she had pneumonia or when she was ill. Um, and I actually didn't know. And then after her death, uh, I discovered, as I said, that everybody had a story. And uh, I started talking, I think this is what women do anyway, <laughs> you know, when they're gone through something, they start talking to all these other people. And I discovered that everybody had a story. And I began to meet with a small group of people. We were, you know, journalists, we were clergy, we were medical people. And the first time we met a group of about 10 or 12 of us, we sat around a table and everybody just told the stories. We all took off our professional hats and just told our stories as people. And at the end of that day, we said, you know, we should be able to do something to make this better. 
um, we shouldn't be going through this with so much uncertainty and pain. Uh, we should be able to make this better. And so we um, started the conversation project in that way um, to think about how we could make it easier for people to have their wishes expressed and respected. Two sides of that. Uh, the first thing being to have your wishes expressed. Uh, and the second thing to have the medical establishment, you know, respect those wishes. And um, we, we went to work, uh, we started our nonprofit under the roof of the Institute for Healthcare Insur excuse me, Healthcare Improvement, which is a wonderful organization. And uh, we began to work on this. And uh, we said, well, what's the first thing we can do? We knew we wanted to have a messaging campaign. We knew our message was, you know, it's always too soon until it's too late, you know, have these conversations. Um, and the first thing that we did was create a conversation starter kit, mm -hmm. uh, which was, and it exists now, and actually there's a variation of it now on our website um, that is perfect for the current situation that we're in, since so many people are finding themselves suddenly faced with really difficult conversations and difficult choices. Yeah. Um, but we started this, uh, this um, conversation starter kit to go through the process of uh, thinking about how they wanted to live at the end of their lives. Uh -huh. The care they wanted, the care they didn't want. Right. So here it's been going a decade. What would you say are some of the major things that you've learned from this? How, how the project's being used or... I mean, you know, and since everybody has a story, what, are there any common themes or, um, you know, after, after 10 years of doing this? Well, one thing that I have certainly seen is how people's um, willingness and openness to have these conversations has increased. I think we've been part of that, but it's also been part of a generational change. Mm -hmm. Um, in other words, you know, my parents' generation, you know, the, the, they, they, they wouldn't say the word cancer, you know, <laughs> and they wouldn't talk about death. They wouldn't talk about a lot of things. And my generation and the baby, the baby boom generation, you know, were talkers. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we have been through a huge number of social changes and we are now facing this one the change that comes with growing older and facing both our parents' deaths and, uh, and thinking about our own end of life and also thinking about making it easier for our adult children, for many of us. And also young people are, are talking about this much more. So I think the big thing that has happened is there really has been um, much more openness uh -huh. about um, uh, having these conversations. The yeah. other big thing I'd say that's been very clear is that the first thing we all need to do is to, well, to talk about this, to find, a, and then to find a person who can be our decision maker if we can't make decisions for ourselves. Those are the two critical things, to have our wishes known and to talk about it with the person who's going to be making decisions for us if we can't make them for ourselves. Right. That's excellent. You know, I think I've read something and probably in the New York Times again about death cafes. Yes. Well, we paired with a group to have death over dinner. And okay. Then, that's right. Death over dinner. Yes. That, Tell us about that. Tell death cafes. And um, uh, we have uh, been a, a part of that movement to bring people together and to uh, talk about um, end of life wishes over dinner, or you can also have. We've had it. We've had death over brunch. You know, <laughs> we've had death, oh, I know we had death over deli. That was another one. Um, so we've been we've done that, and we've uh, often used the conversation starter kit um, as part of that. Yeah. No, that's we great. Have 
on our website, and I hope people will go to it, it's Conversation Project, the conversationproject.org. We've also have some wonderful, funny videos because these subjects are not just grim, you know, they're not, they are also, also pretty funny. We have a couple, one in particular that comes to mind, um, which is about the, the, it's just a funny video about the difficulty of starting these conversations. Yeah. Well, it's true. I mean, a lot of people, they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to think about it. I always say that one of my favorite movies is Harold and Maude. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. Well, one of my main interests, as I said in the introduction, is what I call legacy work as it relates to meaning and purpose. And how, when I use the word legacy, you know, what, what's a first story or impression that comes to mind? Well, it is your immortality. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, immortality is a little bit more than I want to say, but it is your, um, what it is that you leave behind you. So, um, you know, historically, uh, uh, well, currently, people all over are trying to figure out ways to live forever. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? There's all these people in Silicon Valley, forgive me for picking on them, who are trying to think about, oh my goodness, you know, how am I going to live forever? And am I going to freeze my head like Ted Williams' kids tried to freeze his head? I mean, all of these ridiculous things. And the way that you can leave a legacy is by um, sharing a sense of purpose and, and, and basically planting a tree even if it's a sociological tree, even right. if it's an idea tree, leaving something that leaves your, your world, your family, your community better off. And, you know, we're not all lucky enough to be able to have that time. But for those of us who have, in the last hundred years, the, the um, uh, life expectancy has increased so much and the question of what you do with it, you know, it used to be 65 and it was over, you know, uh, and that's just not true anymore. So how is it that you want to use this precious time? Right. No, that's great. Well, how do you think the concept of legacy, you know, maybe have, has changed because of COVID um, or any, any reactions to that? Well, I think people are more conscious, you yes. know, it's the, it's, the, it's the line from Bobby Kennedy's will, be mindful of the uncertainty of life. And I think we are all right now quite mindful of the uncertainty of life. Yes. And that's true whether you're young or whether you're old. And to see, you know, in my own newspaper, uh, just 16 pages of obituaries. Mm -hmm. That is extraordinary. Um, and to know how quickly, uh, and do you have your, uh, have you told the people you love that you love them? Mm -hmm. You know, these, these things, have you, have you, have you, do you have loose ends? <laughs> do you want to uh, uh, be sure that you have, left messages you you've left the people you love in as good a shape as possible mm -hmm. yeah no what do you think? The things no, go that, ahead. i was just going to say i think that one of the things from the conversation project is that having these conversations is a gift you give your children mm -hmm. or a gift you give the people you love who who are going to be your survivors mm -hmm. well my i my my father's going to be 95 and my mom died, she died two years ago, but she, and at 93, so she would have been 95 too. And they live in a, a very nice uh, retirement community that has assisted living. It's, it's a stage thing. But, you know, I, I think that's a gift to us, you know, that they made that decision at age 87, and it's made our life a whole lot easier, especially when my mom was ill for about you know a year off and on she could go to the health center and then go back home and they didn't have to leave you know the building and that we always considered that to be a gift to us so mm -hmm. you know that they had the foresight to do that so um oh uh, do you think about legacy or what your legacy is or will be or what do, what do you think about that related to yourself 
Well, sometimes I think about it in an amused way. When you introduced me a little while ago, you described me as a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. And I've always said, when I got the Pulitzer, I said, now I know the first line of my obit, you know, <laughs> that unless I become a mass murderer or <laughs> something that's highly unlikely, uh, the first line of my obit will be, you know, Ellen Goodman, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist died yesterday. Hopefully won't say that tomorrow, but you know. It, uh, so some of that, I think one of the interesting things for me when I started thinking about what I wanted to do next was sort of what do you do after your obit's been written? I don't mean that, you know, I mean that metaphorically. I, yeah. uh, I mean, you know, I, I've checked off a lot of things on my list. I, I, I my, my, Children are grown up. Now even my grandchildren are in high school and, and um, uh, I've uh, had a, a long and wonderful marriage. Um, and uh, I've done work that was very meaningful to me in terms of um, being a journalist. I had a really lucky run, a wonderful run. Uh, are you working on any book now or anything? Well, now I have just, um, I think my, I, uh, my friend Lynn Scher from ABC and I oh, sure. are putting together a podcast that we call She Votes, exclamation okay. point, and it's celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. Yes. Okay. So we have a podcast that's going to run eight episodes up to August 26th, which is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Um, and that is something that um, uh, I've always written about women's rights and about history. And it's been a, it's a great thing that we're working on right now. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Um, so as you think about your own legacy and, and moving on, in fact, I was going to say, I remember the last article that you wrote in your column um, and I, you know, now that I say that, I want to go back and look it up because I had, it might even be in my Franklin planner because I would keep things. I don't use that anymore, but I would cut things out and then stick them in my Franklin planner. So I want to go back and read that again because it was very moving um, how you just kind of wanted to sign off, you know. Um, and well, I was talking in that about the concept called letting yourself go. Yes. In terms of, of women, it's always had a pretty bad connotation, right? Oh, she's let herself go. But my question was, and remains, is where do you go when you let yourself go? Uh-huh. And so that sense that there is um, uh, another act, and everybody's different. Maybe that other act is, uh, you know, that you want to uh, learn to paint. Maybe it's that you want to read. Maybe right. Maybe you want to you know, uh, uh, travel, whatever. Maybe it's that you want to um, uh, sp spend time just uh, caregiving in your community or your family. Whatever yeah. it is, the question, if, you've been, if you're lucky enough to have that option, the question is where do you go when you let yourself go? And um, I thought about that too, because I've also been very active on the board of Encore.org. Yes. Um, uh, which was always called Second Acts for the Greater Good. And I, I do think, I, I do sort of still believe that service is the rent you pay for living. That's not my line, that is. But service is the rent you pay for living. So what is it that you can keep doing as you, as you get older for as long as you can? Right. No, I love that. I love that. Well, unfortunately, our time's kind of coming to an end. And so I always like to ask people, because um, honestly, Ellen, you know, the, the topics you've written about and books and um, what else should I have asked you that people need to know? What are your words of wisdom? And we can, you know, depending on what you say, we could, we could, have, I, I might have a follow up question, but um, you know, what do you, you know, given like the conversation project or the dinner over death or, um, or death over dinner, I should say, um, you know, what do people, what are the real points that you really want people to know and remember? Well, I guess 
I would turn that back and say, have you had the conversation? Uh, you know what? Well, I think I, I mentioned this to you when I invited you, but you know, my students would call me Dr. Death. And it's because I talk about death, I write about death, I think about it. And I'm, I'm, I plan my funeral the way other people plan parties or <laughs> weddings. <laughs> and so like, I'll go to a funeral and I'm thinking, oh, I want to add that in or, oh, you know what? I would not want to do that. Or so, you know, I, I'm always revising things. And, um, well, and I'd say the other thing is just another thing that I would tell people when they are considering their next stage of life. Um, Give yourself a gap year. Mm -hmm. You know how kids have a gap year when yep. they want to choose before they go to call, college? Or, um, yeah, give yourself a gap year. Spend as much time thinking and planning for what it is that will really um, energize your life as you, you would. You don't think, oh, this is great. Finally, I can color code my, you know, <laughs> my closet. Or, or just, I just want to get out of this job. Think, give yourself time to ask yourself and to pay attention to what it is that will give meaning to your, the next stage of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's excellent. Um, yeah, I have had the conversation and I'm really into legacy letters. So I write my kids, you know, anytime I want to uh, share a lesson learned or maybe give them some advice. And I started the, the legacy letters. I probably started in about uh, 2007, but I've always had a tradition of writing them or sending them postcards and, um, and they keep them. And so I've always had that tradition. And so, um, I find it very meaningful, both for me and for them, because I know if I put it in writing, they're more likely to read it and maybe even save it, Yeah. even though they don't talk to me about it much. So I, I really have, um, you know, uh, the full blown conversation, but I know what you're saying, because, you know, my dad will say things like, well, you know, I'm not going to be around forever. And, and the first thing I say is, well, dad, none of us are going to be around forever, you know? But my sister and I, we've already written his obituary with his help. Uh, so we have that done. And, you know, we, we kind of know what he wants at his service because we kind of did it at the same time we were planning my mom's when she was still alive. So I think we have had those conversations. Um, but I did download your, your starter kit. And I think that that is very valuable. And for your organization, Ellen, do you have to do a lot of fundraising since it's a not-for-profit or... Um, well, it, it, it's, uh, we have had some pretty good loyal funders, and of course, we are also under the roof of the Institute of Healthcare okay. Improvement, but we are always more than happy. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, you know, one of the things that's happened is now we're in some consortiums of other groups, so we've sure. done some joint, joint work, too. Yeah. Well, Ellen, honestly, I've, I've been very honored to interview you. And so I was so thrilled. I was like, truly, I was jumping up and down when you said <laughs> we could do this. So um, the, the emphasis in this series is on learning how to make the rest of life the best of life. And so I wish may the rest of life be the best for you. Thank you very much. And, and I, stay, I, stay I, well. I, I that back at you. <laughs> okay. Stay well and stay hopeful. Thank you. And, um, and may the same be true for you and your family and, you, and your friends. So anyway, Ellen, take care and um, thank you again. Thank you, Jan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.